Yeah, so I'm going to talk about GPUs. I'm going to talk about standard Fortran parallelism. Um, we, NVIDIA, uh, are the team I'm in that I joined in March is really big on uh, bringing together ISO uh, language standard parallelism uh, with GPUs, which is is kind of a new and interesting thing. I, you know, this crowd is obviously interested in the Fortran side. There's also a C++ story because if you're if you're a, a, a linguistically diverse person, you'll know that C++ 17 has some stuff. Um, but I'm going to talk about uh, how the Fortran stuff has worked for me. Obviously, there's a lot of different ways to use Fortran, a lot of different algorithms. Um, I'm really happy with it. It was actually I joined, I, I, you know, I changed jobs in March. And the first thing I did is sat down and do what I do with every new technology I have. And I try to get NWChem to, to use it and see how it goes. And it went pretty well and I was pretty stoked. So I'm gonna talk about that. Um, and and hopefully this is, this is compelling. And if you had no idea that NVIDIA was working on this, then at least you now know uh, we are working on it and we are trying to make 100% standard Fortran run on GPUs, which is a little bit wild, but it, it, it really does work in, in certain cases. Um, okay, so uh, I'm gonna tell you what NWChem is in not so many words, um, and then the algorithm in particular, just so you have a clue about what I'm doing. Uh, I know there's at least a couple of chemists on the call, so it won't be too far, and I apologize to the rest of you. It is. Uh, but I won't, I won't show the Schrodinger equation, so, so don't be worried. Um, and then I'll show you the performance on, on the latest hardware with, with Fortran models. Um, and then I'll just for completeness tell you what the rest of the story is in the compiler. Um, I didn't use every feature we support, um, but I think if you're interested in the topic and how standard Fortran features map onto GPUs, you'll want to know what the list is uh, in case it's something you want to try. So... Uh, very short version, NWChem is a widely used open source quantum chemistry code. It's, you know, has, depending on how we do the math, you know, thousands of users, hundreds of users, um, you know, very, on, on every type of computer, um, every supercomputer that, I, that I'm aware of supports NWChem, uh, it runs on laptops. The only thing it doesn't do is, is Windows, uh, last time I checked. It's, it's massively parallel in the, in the MPI co-ray images sort of way, um, which used to be sufficient. You just keep scaling and multiprocessing with MPI or, or equivalent communication models. Um, now, obviously, life is a little more interesting. Multicore is a little bit more important than it used to be. Uh, one of the important things um, for all of the aspects of NWChem development is NWChem is not a small code. Um, it's not the biggest code in the world, I'm sure, uh, but it's got a million lines of uh, code written by humans and then a bunch more that's generated by computers. Um, it's got a bunch of C code. Uh, I've given a historical talk on this in the past. It's, it's kind of interesting to look at, you know, if you've been around a while and you program computers in, you know, 1992, uh, you have a very different set of skills than, than, than people who start out in, in 2012, uh, just because of the nature of, and diversity of, of operating systems and the like uh, in the 90s before MPI and Linux became normative. Uh, so NWCAM dealt with a lot of pain in the past. It's a lot nicer for us now. We, use, we assume MPI exists, which is not something we did for many years. Um, and now, you know, there's multiple ways of using MPI and, and the communication problem is solved. Um, use of libraries, you know, we don't depend on anything that's not absolutely ubiquitous. Um, so Blas and LAPAC, ScalePAC, not much else. Uh, and MPI, of course. Uh, and, and those are the primary performance factors um, for most of the code. Uh, there is some differentiation for compilers and we do have some open MP code that is sensitive to implementation quality, but those are mostly second order effects. The hardware and the libraries is what matters. Um, and, you know, we are very, very conservative in NWChem with modern Fortran. Uh, we don't use a whole bunch of features. Probably some of them are good reasons. Some of them are bad reasons. Um, but we really like to stay to things that are rock solid and ubiquitous. And, and standard Fortran is, is one, certainly one healthy way um, 
uh, to to not have portability problems. Although, as as I think everybody who's a user knows, not you know, there's not a lot of perfect compilers out there. Um, and if you try to use the latest and greatest Fortran features, sometimes the compilers make you suffer. Uh, but we are interested in doing this, and and this is something we can target for 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 deploying in production because it's it's standard Fortran. So uh, the the physics model I'm looking at is CCSD parenthesis T. Um, you, you could write a whole lot of books on this topic. Um, it's you know the pragmatic version of it is it's the gold standard method. So even if you don't know how it works, it's you know what your PhD advisor tells you to use when you want to get a really accurate answer for a really small problem. Um, and by small, I mean you know five, six, seven atoms, unless you have a supercomputer. Uh, why is parenthesis T this method exist? Well, the method that's cheaper isn't accurate enough. And the method, um, the next method after it uh, is, is, is so expensive, uh, it's, it's borderline unusual, uh, unusable. Um, so parenthesis T is this approximate method uh, for doing the accurate part of the calculation cheaply. Um, there's some really nice stuff online you can read about it. if you're a chemist i recommend the former paper if you really want to get into the the details if you want to see everything possible about quantum chemistry the latter is in my view the greatest book ever written um but this is this is what it looks like at a high level the details don't need to be enumerated uh, we do a number of steps before we get to this final phase of the calculation, which is overwhelmingly dominant in wall time. And uh, the two red boxes, that's, that's basically the story for, from a computational perspective. Um, those two very, very simple array expressions are tensor contractions that uh, consume you know, somewhere between 50 and 90% of the wall time um, and, and that's really what I'm focused on. So everything else that happens, you know, most, mostly happens easily. Um, and, then, and then we grind away on these. And obviously, because this is 80, 90% of the wall time for big calculations, this is where, you know, the supercomputing, GPU, et cetera, angle comes in and why this, these codes have been ported to accelerators, you know, over the past 10 years. There's a couple of pa papers among others, there's probably five or ten papers on this on this method specifically, um, and those are just two that have you know the right references and, and cross cross linking of of what it's about. So um, this is the code. I I will I'll show you the link to the GitHub so you can read the actual thing. I've made some subtle modifications here. Um, at least one standard violating thing, the plus equals term. Um, if you're on the J3 list, you can chuckle about uh, why I might reference that. Uh, it saved me a lot of trouble here. I also collapsed the concurrent statements so the font size was readable. I'm, I'm over 40 now, so I need big font sizes. Um, and then, you know, the rest of it is about the same. So um, it's a very simple compute kernel. Um, there are 27 different expressions of this nature. Um, there are three categories of nine. One category of nine is bandwidth limited and the other two is an inner product and actually has some compute to it. And that's the interesting one that I focus on. Because these are tensor contractions, they've got lots of indices. How you access memory obviously makes a big difference. Um, I'm, even though I'm on at least one paper with some DGEM implementer people, um, I'm not a savvy person at implementing this stuff too well, um, but I do understand how to improve the data layout pattern. So you see here, if you look carefully, there are two four-dimensional array expressions, um, and then there are, they're going to be contracted and accumulated into a 60 expression. I do a pre-transposition on one or the other, depending on what the data access looks like, Unfortunately, there's you know some exhaustive search of what's the optimal way of doing this, and I haven't explored it. I'll get back to why I haven't explored it other than pure laziness in a bit. Um, but uh, you see here, you can generate an enormous amount of parallelism from this. Um, and you know, do concurrent says to the compiler, obviously, you can run this stuff um, in parallel. And 
you know, what the compiler does with that is its business. Some compilers do nothing. Some compilers vectorize. Some compilers map it to OpenMP threads. Our compiler maps it to GPU code in the same way that we <coughs> map OpenACC. For those of you who are familiar with that, <coughs> And OpenACC is what's called a descriptive model. Um, so we interpret this as if the user says a loop can be paralyzed, uh, take that under advisement, but you're not required to paralyze it. Uh, so our compiler will paralyze the loops that it decides are a good idea. Um, and it decides three or four of these loops are worth paralyzing and the others aren't. Um, and then it lays that out in, in GPU code generation. So it does this for a whole bunch of different expressions. You can read all of this. Um, you can see here the, the big green link. Um, that is literally what I'm doing at, at any moment. I, I do not have private copies of anything. It's, it's it, it, for better and for worse. What you see is what you get on GitHub. Um, you can download it, try it out. I have all the different tool chains. I only test a couple of them. Um, there's some old ones that from, from days, days when I worked on BlueGene that, that probably don't work anymore. Um, but but all the code is there. You can try it out. Um, you can complain at me in GitHub if you don't like it. So I'm going to show you some experiments. This is with an A100 DGX station. This is actually the bright shiny box that theoretically goes under your desk. Although I guess it's it's big enough and expensive enough. Probably only stockbrokers have them under their desk. We have ours in a server room. So it's not the the not the server blade. It's it's the workstation. It means it's got four GPUs in it. I'm only timing one. Uh, we'll use MPI for multi-GPU support in NWChem, so that's a non-issue. I used what was the latest version of the compilers and libraries until this morning um, when we released 21.9, so obviously I didn't regenerate the data in the last six hours. Um, I used the latest version of CU Tensor, uh, which will ship with the compilers in the next version after the one that dropped today. Uh, but you can get it right now. And the only reason is they did a performance bug fix for um, the code that I'm about to show you. The problem size here is a tile size of 30. Of 30. Um, if you do the math, 30 to 6 times 8 bytes for a double, this keeps it under 6 gigabytes, which is a good number to keep it under for all sorts of different reasons, both you know small GPUs that people run on at home and also MPI plus GPUs where, you know, you have a lot more than six gigs, but you might have multiple GPUs uh, or multiple MPI ranks using a GPU. So we obviously don't want to psych fall. And 30 is also a good number for all sorts of other reasons. Uh, bigger numbers get in trouble. Smaller numbers don't aren't worth offloading to GPUs. So um, this is, th so this is 27 kernels. You can see the first nine are very low floating point intensity. Um, and they're bandwidth limited. You can basically take, you know, McAlpin stream benchmark and compute what the performance will be um, from, from the bandwidth. Uh, the other 18 kernels have enough flops to, to get above a teraflop. They're, they're not perfect because if you understand that there's a tile size of 30 with, and that's the contracted dimension, uh, it's not enough compute to saturate the peak compute. Um, the speed of light is about four to five teraflops. So you can look at this two different ways. You could say it's getting between three quarters and a full teraflop um, out of four or five as peak. So um, the bad news is it's 25% of peak. The good news is it's 25% of peak on a very powerful processor with absolutely no GPU awareness whatsoever. So you know, if you're out there saying, I want to write Fortran, I want to do GPUs, I don't want to think about GPUs, I don't want to do any of that. Um, there is nothing about GPUs in the Fortran code, nor the C code that calls it, except for one thing, which is that I use the CUDA unified memory allocator. You don't have to do that if your host code is in Fortran, um, because our Fortran compiler can use unified memory automatically. I just happen to, for historical reasons, have a C driver, um, and that C driver calls CUDA directly. Doesn't make a difference. The other thing about this that is potentially interesting for people is that there is a what we call Stdpar, or which is the compiler flag that we use, but that just means do concurrent. So do concurrent, OpenACC, and OpenMP are 
you know, plus or minus noise and compiler, you know, variations of that I haven't figured out yet um, are the same. Okay. Um, you know, I know that there's all sorts of, you know, political slash re religious debates about, you know, which is the one true programming model. Um, I'll, I'll be, I'll pander a little bit and say, you know, Fortran is the one true programming model. Um, but, you know, I know some of you are probably getting advice on using OpenMP or, you know, maybe OpenACC, but most of it, the world seems to say that everybody has to use OpenMP now. Um, what we see from this is if you can use do concurrent and you have a compiler that supports GPUs, you don't have to think about directives at all. You don't have to wade into the OpenACC versus OpenMP debate. You can just ignore them and write Fortran. Obviously, OpenMP has been around a long time. OpenACC has been around uh, almost as long um, or maybe half as long. Um, they have a lot more features, a lot more control. There are reasons to use them. Um, but certainly for a certain class of application that maps nicely onto what the Fortran language has today, um, there really is no need to, to go to anything else. Now I'll show you um, the other part of the story, which this is where you could say um, one of two things. You could say um, libraries are great and writing code yourself is hard, or you could say Jeff is dumb and, and doesn't know how to write code as good as his NVIDIA colleagues, which is absolutely true, by the way. So the, the, the purple, maroon, whatever wine-colored CU tensor number, um, that's written by um, my, my colleague, um, Paul Springer, um, who's very, very good at this stuff. And, and so CU tensor is like a BLAS library for tensors. Um, and it gets um, much closer to the, the th theoretical peak. Um, sorry, I got it. What's, is, do I need to pay attention to the chat? Oh, I see. Um, okay, so what this means is if you can call a library, that's fantastic, do it. But you can still get 25% of a very, very good number um, without, without doing too much work and just by thinking Fortran. Um, you can also look at the CPU versus GPU numbers, but that's a hardware discussion, doesn't really matter. Okay, so summary so far, do concurrent works as well as the directive models if you can do it, which in this case you can. Um, it is very important to have unified memory. If you don't have unified memory, then you got to do all the memory management stuff. Um, and you know, if you're using an ancient GPU or a GPU um, that for you know from another vendor that doesn't support unified memory, then you have a different story. But we support unified memory; it makes things a lot easier. Okay, now. The other part of this that's really interesting is tuning. Okay, so it's one thing to say um, a certain version of this Fortran code runs really well on a GPU. How, how generalizable is that? Well, it turns out that as folks probably expect, not all compilers do the exact same thing with every piece of code. Um, every implementation teams make different choices. So this is the code I wrote uh, with, with an NVIDIA GPU in mind. It doesn't have any GPU reference. It's just that this is what I came to and it worked really well on NVIDIA hardware. What I've discovered, of course, is that uh, the same code does not run as well on an Intel Xeon CPU with the Intel Fortran compiler. And so I tried to figure out why. So the first thing I did is I looked at the code that I've been working on for many, many years, which is the OpenMP CPU code that I tuned um, over many, many years for, for Xeon. It's not perfect, but it certainly was, was better than random. Um, and I saw, okay, I'm only paralyzing the outer three um, loops. And uh, because the Intel compiler is very interpreting what the, the code says prescriptively, meaning if you say parallel, compiler does parallel, no questions asked. If you say SIMD, compiler does SIMD, no questions asked. It will not fight with you. Um, that's, that's a philosophical choice from their compiler team. I understand it, I can defend it. Uh, I don't necessarily like it. So what I learned from this is, okay, if I wanna, if I wanna get the performance of OpenMP from Intel Fortran, I gotta make it look about the same. So I put do concurrent in the exact same places as I did um, OpenMP. If you're looking at the details, not all the indices are the same. Some of that is I haven't yet synchronized every single loop. Um, it could also be that the compiler does slightly different things. But the important part of this is if you want your code to perform like OpenMP, and your do concurrent implementation maps exactly like OpenMP, well, then they got to look the same. So um, there is potentially a performance portability issue here. Uh, this is unfortunately not easily solved. I don't have an answer other than, you know, all compiler people should be perfect and do everything right all the time on all the hardware. 
Um, and I'm, I'm not planning on holding my breath for that. So the tuning principles, as I said, very straightforward. If your compiler treats do concurrent like OpenMP, you've got to, you've got to take out your OpenMP tuning guide. If your compiler treats do concurrent like OpenACC, you should take out your OpenACC tuning guide. The good news is those two guides already exist. We don't need to write a new guide called tuning do concurrent. We just need Fortran compiler people to be transparent about how they do these things. And you know, at least we at NVIDIA, I think have been pretty straightforward about saying how we do this and our diagnostic info statements from the compiler are consistent. They're actually the same. You'll see the same diagnostics if you use OpenACC or do concurrent. So you know they're the same. Um, the other tuning principle is obviously from the CU tensor result, which is if somebody has written perfect code for your processor, call that perfect code. Of course, most quantum chemistry applications don't have a library that works perfectly for them. Um, CU tensor is not a standard and not available everywhere. Certainly, if you can use CU tensor, it's magical. Um, please do so. But if you don't, or you just like writing this stuff by hand for any number of reasons, you can do a lot of powerful things just with do concurrent. Um, I got two, I think two or three more slides. I hope I'm not um, running out of time. So- uh, You've got three, three minutes left. Perfect, I think that'll work. Um, so no one in their right mind should ever write triple loop matrix multiplication. I think everybody knows that at this point, although I hear every once in a while that there are physicists in the world that have not heard of the blahs. But the good news is we don't need to tell them about the blahs. We just need to tell them about Fortran. So it turns out uh, Fortran 90 has had these mathematical intrinsics for you know in there and they can map perfectly onto blahs calls. Um, the neat thing is you can map a lot more than just MATMOL onto a library like CU Tensor, and we've done that. And so the neat thing here is you could take your terrible triple loop code, you can turn it into the right way to write Fortran, uh, and it will just run on a GPU. Um, and, it, and it will run using the CU Tensor backend. You can see you can get eight to 20 teraflops, give or take. Um, out of the latest GPUs. That's amazing considering you're just calling Fortran. You didn't even know you had a GPU. You didn't even know it was supported, um, you know, all those things. Um, there's another, there's a whole long list. Why is it not going anywhere? Oh, there we go. Um, this is a, a list of examples. Um, obviously my slides will be available. Um, this is part of our documentation somewhere. There is a whole bunch of different mathematical intrinsics in Fortran, which happen to have exact equivalents in CU, uh, CU Tensor, which CU Tensor is actually created in part to support machine learning. So it turns out, um, you know, and there's an alternative universe where machine learning people actually discovered Fortran and they used it and they got great results because it's, it's a, it'd probably fa be fantastic for them. But in any case, you can see here, you got ceiling, you got abs, you got all the data parallel operations, you got reshape, et cetera, et cetera. These all map onto CU Tensor, um, assuming they're recognized correctly. The compiler will usually tell you if it, if it can or can't do that. So if you can write code using these Fortran intrinsics, um, and not all algorithms, of course, can do that, um, but if you're smart enough or, or you have nice enough code to figure this stuff out, you can use it and it'll work really nicely. So summary. You can use standard Fortran with do concurrent to hit at least a teraflop um, on a GPU, and you can get four teraflops if you call a library, um, if one exists. Um, so if you hadn't heard it before, some people don't even know NVIDIA has a Fortran compiler. It's of course the rebranded version of the PGI compiler um, with, with a lot more work on it in the last two years. Um, but we do support do concurrent um, on G and array intrinsics running on GPUs. Um, the do concurrent behaves like open ACC um, and you know everything maps the intrinsics all map onto CU tensor when they're recognized and the compiler will tell you what's going on so if you're if you're scared of GPUs but you like Fortran um, you'll like our compiler I hope um, and you know standard parallelism in Fortran's not perfect on performance portability you're into discussion time now excuse me okay. that's cool I'm almost done um, it's not perfect on performance portability uh, but you can run the exact same code on CPU and GPU, uh, which you can't really do with OpenMP, which is kind of a thing that, you know, would, would seem like it was an important caveat that people should talk about more, but, but they don't. I will also mention uh, having unified memory hardware is really important uh, to this story, uh, but I won't go into any details. 
Um, and you're welcome to, um, you know, throw tomatoes on Twitter I, or uh, send me an email um, or if all else fails, use LinkedIn. So thank you very much. I'd like to pick up a couple of questions that have come in on do concurrent because that's pretty key part of what you've been telling us. The first one is from Harvey Richardson. He says, uh, what happens if you have a sequence of do concurrent? Um, two scenarios, same index space, different index space. What happens? I don't know if the compiler will use them. I have heard that so I know the Cray compiler and the Intel compiler are both capable of doing some really wild things with that in OpenMP. I am not aware of what the state of the practice is uh, for do concurrent. Um, I would hope that they would be pipelined at least in the offload sense, although I can't even guarantee that off the top of my head. Um, if you have an example of something you would like to work really well, feel free to email me um, and I'll tell our compiler team about it. Um, one of the things I'm sort of talking about tomorrow is, you know, there, there, are, some, there are some things we can't do with do concurrent yet um, because of asynchrony that we'd really like to do on GPUs. And one of them is, um, you know, when you're offloading, you'd like to pipeline even, you know, the pipeline in the sense of overlapping the transfers with the, the kernel executions. Um, but, but I think fusion is, a, is something I'm not familiar with. And I hope that was the question. If not, we can talk on Slack. And the second question I was going to pick up was from Tom Clune, who is asking, is there a rough rule of thumb for how much computational density an algorithm needs in order to offset the overload of do concurrent? Well, it depends on where do concurrent runs. Um, if you're gonna offload do concurrent onto a GPU, I'd say you better have a lot of work to do. Um, you know, that's that's always true of GPU. So so the standard you know, rule of thumb on kernel launch is seven microseconds to, to, to fire up a GPU kernel. Um, and then there's the bus transfer, which happens, I think, you know, at 10 to 20 gigabytes a second on, on you know, most hardware, sometimes better um, on special hardware. So you do the math on that and say, um, if, it's, if it's not significantly more than seven microseconds, you're, you're probably dead in the water. Um, and if you're not doing enough compute to pay for the data transfer, um, you're dead in the water, unless your data is already on the GPU, which with unified memory is not hard to do. If you, if you hit the same data over and over again, it'll stay on the GPU. Um, now, if you're running do concurrent on a CPU, I think the, the numbers change, but it's, it's sort of the same question of, I think an OpenMP um, fork is probably on the order of, of, of a few microseconds, um, hopefully better than that, but it depends. So yeah, I mean, you have to have, you have to have millions, if not billions of, of operations uh, to use do concurrent. Um, but, you know, that's, I think that's true of all parallel motifs. And I have another question from, um, uh, who is it from? Uh, Rohit Goswami, uh, pointing out that there's a project for rewriting NWChem in C++. Uh, with the intention of getting enormously better performance. Do you have any comments on that? <laughs> yes. Um, not, not ones that fit in the time that, that I have. Um, it, is, it is correctly stated it's a ground up rewrite in C++. Um, there, there are a whole lot of good arguments and a whole lot of bad arguments. Um, so the reality is NWChem was written in the 90s and included code from the 1980s. Um, it has a lot of common blocks in it. And I know you probably a lot of hairs just stood on end when I said common blocks. Um, something would have to be rewritten from scratch, whether it was Fortran or C++ uh, to, to get much better performance. 
It is a cultural aspect of the world today that is a lot easier to find a C++ performance programmer than a Fortran one. Um, that's truly sad, but it's, it's the nature of life. Um, so the C++ rewrite, I think, is the result of a number of cultural phenomena um, and a number of historical phenomena. Uh, I wish that it was not rewritten, but rather modernized in place with, with modern Fortran. Um, but, you know, I, I wasn't in DOE headquarters when that decision was made. Well, thank you very much. Time's up. So thank you for your talk. That was, that was fascinating.